Yes, enforcement will be needed, but the success, it's a sectoral regulation, will come from the fact that with the DSA, we will work together, the network of regulators, with industry, to deliver a better world, a safer uh, digital world, and that we will construct collectively something. Good um, morning, everyone. Uh, so I'm Alexandre Strel, a co-director uh, co at CER, uh, uh, an academic director at CER. Um, and so we have this first panel on, on the DSA, and then we will have um, three panels in the afternoon on the DMA, and then there will be a conclusion by uh, uh, Alberto Baciega, the equivalent of Rita in um, DG, DigiCom. So here, really, what I would like to do is to, to focus um, on the DMA, and I suggest we will go in that order. So first, uh, um, I will ask uh, my colleague Sally Broughton-Mikova. Um, she's also a, a co-director at CER and a professor at the University of East Anglia um, to have uh, her view on um, what she's doing at CER uh, regarding the DSA and also what her, uh, um, her view of the difficulty of enforcement. Then I will go to Benoit Loutrel, um, uh, who is a board member uh, of ARCOM, the French um, media and platform regulator and the French uh, DSC, to understand a bit better uh, how uh, the French authority is preparing itself for, um, uh, uh, for the work um, and also how the cooperation among the DSC is organized. And if you want to come back on the French law, you are welcome to the French draft law. We are welcome to do that as well, but you are not obliged to do that. Um, then I will go to Camilla Bustani. She's a director international affairs at Ofcom, uh, the UK uh, media and telecom regulator, and which has also a new task now with the DSA um, equivalent, the Online Safety Act. Um, and so, uh, Camilla, I would also ask you, how do you prepare yourself for this, for the enforcement of the um, Online Safety Act, and also how you envisage international cooperation um, with uh, the um, Commission and with the Digital Service Coordinator in Europe and beyond. Um, and then I will go to uh, Julian Rausch, who is online, um, is uh, from a foundation in, the, um, in Germany. And also, uh, Julian, I will ask you what is your first impression of the uh, DSA um, enforcement. I don't know if we can see him at some point uh, online, so it will be easier for me to moderate. And finally, um, I will come to... Um, to Rita, uh, who kindly take over Irene, uh, who is ill. We have two uh, persons which are ill, uh, Irene in the morning and then Richard Fizi uh, in the afternoon. So thank you very much. And Rita, you will react maybe on what you have heard uh, so far. So um, let's go to you, Sally. If, if any one of you can limit your intervention to five minutes, uh, no more. Uh, so we have then a possibility to take questions. I can take questions from the room. I also can take questions <laughs> online uh, via uh, Zoom, uh, and, um, and, and so uh, if everyone is limiting to five minutes, then we can have a, an, another discussion, okay? Thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. Am I? Yes. Um, <clears throat> so, thank you very much, Alex. Um, I think it's a great time to be talking about this, given the, the, the deadlines coming up. Um, as a public policy scholar, in my mind, kind of the most courageous and innovative element of the DSA are the provisions around due diligence for very large online platforms and, and very large online services. Um, and it's innovative in the risk management approach to preventing harm to society and the economy, right? It, it, it isn't just about individual users. Um, <clears throat> the areas of systemic risk are ambitious and wide reaching Right? So they include negative effects on all fundamental rights, um, on important societal institutions like electoral processes, public security and health, um, as well as the negative effects on individual physical mental health, and especially minors. So the justification for this was quite clear. These services function as public spaces. 
right? and that was a language that was used in the documentation that led up to the DSA. Um, and they play essentially a systemic role in European societies because of their reach and because of the functionalities that they provide. Um, and now the policy problems of protecting public spaces is not entirely new, okay? So mainstream media have been playing a similar role for decades, particularly broadcast media. But of course, the regula regulation of these public spaces and key, key elements of our public discourse and, and, and um, public understanding, they, they have been regulated in a very different way. They rely on editorial responsibility for balancing fundamental rights and for truth seeking that's governed by codes of ethics, clear rules on content, such as for protection of minors or bans on hate speech and incitement, et cetera. Now, the systemic risk management approach in the DSA is different because it needs to be different, right? It's the kind of accountability that has been constructed in the DSA is suited to the nature of those services, right? It does mean what the DSA, in my mind, has kicked off what has got to be a continuous feedback loop of understanding risks, assessing effectiveness and mitigations, and ideally arriving pretty quickly at better protections for consumers and for society much larger. Um, Last summer, my colleague Andrea Kalif and I published a SARE report that was based on um, extensive research on this idea of systemic risk. Um, and we, or what we did was go back to where systemic risk has a lot of experience uh, in financial services. Right? Um, and um, of course, these are very different beasts, right? But we thought there might be something useful that could be learned. Um, and we did find a couple of points that we think could be useful. Um, first of all, um, VLOPs and VLOSAs, unfortunately, perhaps, but I can't resist it. Um, they're at the center of their platform ecosystems. Often these platform ecosystems are integrated with the platform ecosystems of other services, right? Other VLOPs and VLOSAs and complementers, and also actors. And all of those can be sources of risk, could also contribute to mitigation, right? So it might be important to look at these nodes. Another thing we found was that there's very high chances that services will be exposed to common sources of systemic risk. And they could be through shared reliance on assets, shared relationships with common third parties, right? or exposure to common malicious actors like troll farms, right? And these things can be operating across platforms or there could be about the design and the nature of the, the ecosystem. Right. Other thing we found was that whereas with financial services you have a clear definition of failure, right? you can do a calculation my, perhaps a complicated one, but you can arrive at what is systemic failure in financial services, there's no more money, or things are collapsing, right? But we don't have such a clear benchmark when it comes to these risk areas, right? One instance of CSAM is a failure, but what exactly is a failure of civic discourse and electoral processes? There's lots of indices, there's a lot of things that we can use to arrive at that. And these benchmarks are important for understanding exactly what are the negative effects that need to be mitigated. Right? Um, what would good look like in terms of the role of digital services in these areas? Right? So it leads it us in this report to suggest some things that could be considered. Um, first, to could be considered by platforms in their assessment of risk is not just what's happening in their own ecosystem. So not just the amount of content that they're taking down and how quickly, or the robustness of their age verification systems, but also the nature of their relationships and their assets, right? Through their contracts, through functionalities that might be sources of risk, a kind of more qualitative approach of it to assessing risk. It also indicates that looking at these shared assets and interlinkages right, at the level of users and complementers even might be useful for understanding the common sources of risk 
and informing cooperation on mitigation. And cooperation among the providers on mitigation is foreseen in the DSA. Right? In Article 351H, it talks about initiating or adjusting cooperation with other providers of online platforms or online search engines through codes of conduct and the crisis protocols. It doesn't have to stay at the level of codes of conduct, right? and that we don't have to be only talking about existing codes of conduct. There are already lots of cooperation on CSAM, on terrorist content, code of conduct on, on, on hate speech and practice on disinformation, etc. There are these things that are good um, examples and this is a process where we can be looking at that, what else is needed. Right? The Commission and the DSCs are going to have an overarching picture of this and perhaps the most powerful aspect of the DSA are the extensive information gathering and data access powers given to digital service coordinators and to the Commission. There's going to be a chance for the rest of us to have a better view on these things when the first annual reports come out. <coughs> and I think civil society, academia and civic institutions and other member state actors can play a role into feeding into the benchmarks about what is the balance of fundamental rights in risk mitigation that needs to be achieved? What would success look like in mitigating these risks, particularly the ones that are common across services? And I would argue at establishing sort of where, where is the, the level of pollution from malicious user behavior or harmful content that reaches the tipping point and constitutes a crisis, right? Like we have with climate change, right? Where is the tipping point of voter suppression and disinformation that really kills an election, right? Where is it become a crisis that then needs to activate a whole other set of protocols, right? Where is that in relation to public health and security? So the DSA foresees a lot of potential for this involvement, not just through the Article 40 data access, provisions for researchers, but it directly calls on service providers to test their assumptions and involve independent experts in civil society in the conduct of research assessments and the design of their mitigations. Auditors can also use third parties as well. Now, ad hoc, this really might test the capacity of civil society and academia and independent experts, so perhaps some structuring and collectivizing inputs in priority areas might be useful. We are working um, now on another SARE project um, with the intention of doing that. Um, first, we're looking at civic discourse and electoral processes and going to stakeholders and trying to gather that input, um, and the next thing we'll be doing is relation to terrorist content. So, um, I'll just finish saying you know, the DSA aims for a safe and predictable online environment, but we are not living in a safe and predictable geopolitical situation <laughs> um, or political situation at the level of member states. Um, and the DSA has kicked off a really important learning and information and reflection process that I hope will be not just about preventing harm, but perhaps achieving the good <laughs> eventually. Thank you very much, Sally. And in clearly, I mean, the systemic risk assessment that the platform now have to be done, the very large number of platforms have to be done, is clearly one of the key new provision, which, uh, as Rita was saying before, will increase transparency next to the transparency report that we're mentioning. But this is a complex new animal, and I think we are all thinking of how um, to do it the best way. So, um, now, um, Benoit, um, how ARCOM is preparing itself uh, for um, um, the DSA implementation and how you envisage the cooperation with the other DSC in the Commission. Thank you uh, and thank you for inviting us today uh, to share our experience. I guess that uh, we are in a unique position, not because of the law, uh, but because in France, ARCOM, uh, we, the French Parliament and the French government have been grooming us for the last five years to be the future digital service coordinator for France, meaning that uh, we had laws in France prefigurating the DSA, uh, which were useful in going through the learning curve and feeding, in fact, the uh, thinking of how to design the DSA, but also, of course, helping us getting ready what does it mean to be a regulator of digital platforms, because it's clearly completely different from what you do as a regulator of uh, traditional media. So we have been developing skills in understanding how to fight misinformation, how to fight hate speech. And we are in the process now of converting all this experience 
in uh, value to be hopefully uh, meaningful uh, DSCs. And it's really a transformation process. Uh, think of a butterfly, we are converting ourselves. Because looking backwards, we were the French regulator. Looking forward, we are the French player of the team of EU regulators. And it's completely different. Yesterday, we were working with platform established in France to make sure they would comply with the French laws and to protect the French citizen. Tomorrow, as a French digital service coordinator, we may be in charge of the comply enforcing the DSA for a platform like Hubo. Hubo is a small social network with a great success with teenagers speaking English. And as you can imagine, they are not based in France because our teenagers speak French. So typically, we will enforce maybe the DSA on Hubo to the benefit of other AU citizens who happen to speak English or even non-EU citizen. And uh, so that's really something new. It means that all the digital service coordinator will be working to the benefit of all European citizens. So it's a complete change of mindset. Uh, we used to be national regulators working in silos in our countries. We are going to work collectively. If tomorrow in Estonia, uh, because they are really good in digital stuff, they are more efficient in taking advantage of Article 39, which creates a database of advertisement, to identify the public health issue. Maybe we want to send this information quickly everywhere in the network so that all DSCs reach out to the Ministry of Health in their respective member state to, to do the same thing, to replicate. So it's really a major change of how we operate as regulators. We are really a team. And there is a captain in the team, happened to be on my right. <laughs> so that's really something which is major. To make it concrete, uh, we used to work on disinformation. We issued a recommendation to the platform how to fight disinformation. The EU Commission set up the code of practice on fighting disinformation. We were working in parallel tracks. We are in the process of merging the tracks. The Commission will soon convert the code of practice in maybe in a code of conduct, and we are only now working saying, okay, how can we participate in the monitoring of whether this code is being implemented in France? How can we mobilize everybody to understand, is it effective? How can we participate in sending back the information to the EU level to have a, a better dynamics? And we are already seeing that this thing happen. And I think that as you know, as it was said, <laughs> the law which will convert it in a DSC is under discussion with the French Parliament and with the Commission. <laughs> but as far as I know, the articles designating ARCOM as a DDT and CNIL as a, as a competent authority and the DDCCRF also are, have been approved by the both chamber of the Parliament on are not the raising any issue. And we have been requested by the French government to move in a prefiguration phase and already start implementing the DSA. So we are already working with the commission following the recommendation that was issued in December to actually start the implementation, although we don't have the enforcement power. But initially, you don't need the enforcement power because it's a sectoral regulation. The bulk of the value will come from working with industry. I'm sure that enforcement and will be needed, but enforcement will not bring the success. And I think that's something interesting. It's an interesting question at this point. How do we collectively define the success of the DSA? Yes, enforcement will be needed, but the success, it's a sectoral regulation, will come from the fact that with the DSA, we will work together, the network of regulators, with industry to deliver a better world, a safer uh, digital world, and that we will construct collectively something. And it's something, I guess, it's important because we realize that we have together to align ourselves. Is it working? Hello? Yeah. Uh, to align ourselves on, uh, uh, on shaping the expectation of what is the success of the DSA. Uh, we have a lot of discussion with stakeholders in France, media, CEOs, government, member of parliament, uh, and what is a success? And some people are telling us 
So success will be coming uh, by putting fines. We say no. Maybe we'll put fines, the commission will put fines, we'll do it maybe also. But fines are not a criteria of success, rather a criteria of failure. Success comes through compliance. Uh, success comes the fact that we are, uh, we are really changing how we operate. Other people are telling us that success means that hate speech will disappear, that uh, online harassment will disappear. No. Hate is part of our society. The DSA does not have the power to prevent wars in Ukraine or wars in Israel. But the DSA has the power to, make a, to empower us to be in a position to deal efficiently with those crises. And we are already seeing the benefit. Yesterday, we called a meeting, uh, I guess like a proto-DSC or as a former French regulator or both, uh, to prepare the upcoming Olympic Games. We had 15 NGOs, some of them were trusted flaggers and, uh, and other old re self regulation scheme and good candidates maybe to be uh, d um, uh, trusted flaggers under the DSA looking forward. We had uh, 10 uh, departments of the French government. We had 10 platforms and everybody, we were already in a DSA mode. We were acting as a coordinator, helping everybody to understand who is doing what, how do we get ready to deal with all the information disorders that we are going to see on the side of the Olympic Games. And uh, the spirit had changed. Clearly, we realized that the platform were more engaged because, and very interestingly, the vocabulary had changed. And it was the vocabulary of the DSA. People were discussing risk. We have identified the risk that the athletes are going to be harassed. And they were using the, really this vocabulary. Identify risk mitigation measure, and the f it was clear the platform had in mind that they will have to be accountable under the DSA scheme on how they would behave uh, during the Olympic Games. So I think that uh, we have clearly uh, the condition for success, condition to accelerate, because we are seeing also all the other DSCs across Europe starting mobilizing each other. We have started informal groups where we have reading groups. We take the article of the DSC and say, okay, Let's read Article 40. Do we all have the same reading? Where do we have misunderstanding? Where should we work with the Commission to clarify things? So the dynamics are really incredible. And hopefully, I guess, uh, we will manage to accelerate in the coming year by building, following the, commission, the leadership of the Commission, a shared vision for the implementation of the, of the DSA and to have a shared strategy. Thank you for reminding me that I should conclude. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Benoit. It's always... Uh, Fascinating to listen to you, and so clearly, I mean, this idea of cooperation, cooperation with um, the regulated firm, cooperation with the other DSC, is absolutely key. But can I, can I just one ask you one follow-up question? And playing the devil advocate here, because I mean, this is clearly not what we have seen in the context of the GDPR enforcement. Okay, and so my question is, why do you think here that would be different? I think GDPR is a great text. In the US who are lacking uh, something equivalent to protect privacy are clearly saying they need something equivalent to GDPR. But we have also learned from the GDPR, GDPR experience. And uh, I guess, yes, the mic. Yeah, those two speakers. OK. This is antenna? OK. <laughs> what can I say? I used to be in telecommunication regulation. <laughs> Don't love. Sorry, I guess we have learned a lot from the GDPR experience and having this architecture where the VLOPs are under the supervision of the Commission, having the Commission as a member directly of the network at the center uh, is clearly uh, creating an incredible dynamics. And at the same time, we all feel the pressure to, to, to organize the success of the DSA. So I guess in our case, we started uh, uh, traveling to Brussels to discuss with the Commission, saying we want to do something different, we want to work with you, we are not competing with the Commission, we want, just want to be, for them to be useful. Uh, we traveled to, to Dublin, we had an incredible uh, welcome from the Irish regulator, and we really see this dynamic everywhere. 
and the governance allows us to really work together because we we have this shared uh, center with this uh, this uh, commitment from the commission on the great work we, which is being done on the VLOPs. That makes an incredible difference. Uh, I guess the other thing also is that in GDPR, uh, you know, you remember GDPR is a one size fits all, one rule for everybody, uh, which is tricky. Uh, the DSA, you have five size and this XXXL size, VLOPS, which is really useful also, which makes sense. Uh, and we will focus on that initially because that's the success of the DSA will lies mainly in the success of the VLOPS bar. That's why it's really on the top of our priority. We will do what is required from us as national regulators to enforce it also on smaller platform. But we hear from everybody in France that we are expected to support the work of the Commission on the VLOPS regulation. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and that's why also our compliant DSA compliance firm that Bruno announced uh, this morning would be useful. First, to, to help this kind of cooperation and, and also to, um, to check the, the enforcement. Uh, Camilla, now, how Ofcom is preparing for um, the OS? the Online Safety Act, huh? because we are still used to the OSB, but OSA, and also this cooperation with the European authorities, the, the national regulator in the European Union, but also beyond. Thank you very much, Alex. Uh, so the UK is not part of this particular party on the DSA, but we have a, a very similar party. We like to say that uh, the Online Safety Act is a cousin of the DSA, sort of genetically related, not entirely identical. Um, and we've been working on preparing for it for a few years. We were lucky enough to be uh, funded uh, to start preparations well before the legislation uh, took effect. Uh, and over the last sort of two to three years, we have hired about 350 people, which is quite a lot. Um, we've done over 100 pieces of research as part of our um, building of an evidence base for uh, identifying harms and for populating the documents that I'll soon mention. And also, we have been the regulator for video sharing platforms under the Audiovisual Media Services Director, uh, Directive, um, which took effect in the UK just before we left the EU. And that has been uh, an incredibly valuable learning experience, something like a pilot uh, in some ways of regulating online platforms. So we've, we've been preparing through, through that um, and the experience we've obtained through that has been incredibly useful in informing our approach under the Online Safety Act. The act itself requires us to uh, still publish over 40 pieces of guidance, codes of practice, registers, uh, reports, advice, statements, research. So we're going to be busy. Um, for the next few years, and we've already started. Uh, once the act came into effect last autumn, uh, within a few weeks we published about 1,800 pages worth of consultation documents. This is only the first tranche of three tranches of consultation documents that we are planning to publish. Um, this one focused on the approach to risk assessment and dealing with illegal harms. Um, and there will be more in the spring focusing on the protection of children um, and then later on uh, on transparency, obligations, user empowerment. So that's sort of what we've done in the UK so far. Um, we haven't really done it in isolation though. It's been really important for us from the very start to be in dialogue with other people around the world who um, are grappling with the same challenges. And it's not just the EU, it's, uh, it's around the world. Uh, because obviously the internet doesn't have borders, it's the same companies, the same business models, the same types of challenges, even if our regimes are not identical. Um, and stakeholders have been really begging us to uh, not work in isolation. So one of the first things we hear when we meet with stakeholders with the platforms is, are you talking to Europe? <laughs> uh, because they know the DSA is coming, they know the OSA is coming, um, and they don't want to have to build two different systems. In fact, we don't want them to have to build two different systems either because it's costly and will create more compliance friction. And if you have compliance friction, you have less chances of getting compliance. And as Benoit said, our objective is compliance. So um, it's really important for us to work together 
uh, with all of the emerging regimes, the EU for sure as it's the most mature, uh, but also the Australians who are the first online safety regulatory regime um, and others that come uh, in our wake. And for us as regulators, it's really critical because um, we want to avoid allowing the creation of uh, regulatory arbitrage opportunities, uh, forum shopping opportunities, things which will undermine all of our collective objectives. Um, we also think that if we cooperate in the early stages, cooperating the design of, of the regimes and, how, our, and how, our, how we approach our powers, will make it easier for us to uh, carry on the dialogue uh, as, as these regimes mature, uh, and also to compare outcomes uh, and to be able to draw conclusions on things that work and things that don't, and to draw lessons uh, which benefit all of us. Um, I think it's important to remember that um, this is very, very new for everyone. It's obviously new for platforms, many of which have never been regulated before. Uh, and who don't know what it means to have a relationship with a regulator, we shouldn't under, underestimate the importance of that big leap that they have to take. But also, it's a big leap for us as regulators because the form of uh, regulatory interaction, regulatory relationship that we have to develop with the platforms is very different from what we are used to having. Um, Ofcom has regulated telecoms companies for 20 years. Uh, this is different. Um, and the nature of this relationship has been compared to financial services regulation, uh, as, as, uh, as we've heard. Um, it, it's, we call it a sort of supervisory relationship. It means that we don't just set a rule, monitor compliance, wait for someone to report a breach, slap a fine, move on. This is an ongoing dialogue because actually, in some respect, it's not really a compliance framework, it's a do the right thing framework, right? So the, the, the bar that companies have to meet is going to be continually shifting because their commercial models will be continually shifting, the technology will be continually shifting, the types of harms will be evolving. Uh, and so that requires a sort of sustained conversation, sustained dialogue with platforms. That's new for us. Um, it'll be new for ARCOM, it'll be new for the Commission, and I think it's really in our collective benefit to uh, share our experience of how that works um, and also share the kinds of things that we're being told by platforms about what, what, what is possible, because we don't want them to be telling uh, us that they can't do something, but then someone else has managed to persuade them to do it. Um, ultimately, we're, we're all trying to achieve the same objectives. So um, I mentioned earlier that the regimes are genetically related. Um, this is a really important point for us. They sort of share a common architecture. They're all based on this concept of platforms taking responsibility for the choices that they make in designing their products and services, um, rather than just simply taking responsibility for complying with a set of rules. And that is uh, structurally really different from previous uh, regimes. And what it means is that the regulatory tools that derive from that architecture will be common to all of us. So even though our regimes are different in, in terms of scope in some respects, in terms of the types of harms that we're focusing on, both of our regimes, the EU and the UK, share the same regulatory tools. Transparency is, is fundamental. The concept of a risk assessment and an audit, concepts like researcher access, these are incredibly powerful tools and we need to work together to, um, to develop them because they are, they are new for us also. So uh, I guess the question is how do we cooperate? Um, that's, uh, there, are, there are a number of ways. So one, one way is continuing the bilateral relationships that we've always had with our uh, regulatory counterparts in the EU, even though we're not in, in the EU anymore. We have a very, very strong dialogue with ARCOM, for example. Um, we will continue that. Uh, we have just passed in the UK a uh, statutory instrument that empowers Ofcom to share information with a list of uh, established online safety regulators. Uh, that list will grow as new regulators come online. Um, and I think that information sharing will be a really critical way of, of allowing us to, to cooperate and, and, and share experiences. Um, we also have, uh, we don't have the DSC network, the board, unfortunately, but we jointly launched with the Australian e Safety Commissioner, with the Fijians, um, and with the Irish uh, about a year and a half ago, the Global Online Safety Regulators Network, a bit of a mouthful, Gosern, 
also a bit of a mouthful. Um, but the idea is that we want to uh, bring together all of the emerging regimes um, as they come on board and to try to sort of organize ourselves around this concept that I mentioned earlier, this idea of platforms taking responsibility for their choices they make in the design of their products and services. Um, if, we can, if we can promote this sort of common architecture, then we don't really have to worry that much about the fact that there will inevitably be differences in the normative standards that apply around the world to reflect differences in um, political and cultural needs and, and sensitivities. But if we have the same architecture, then we will have similar, the same kind of set of regulatory tools, and we will have something really to work together on, uh, on developing. It's also worth mentioning that uh, unlike in the uh, sectors we are used to regulating, a lot of work has and has been taking place over the, the last you know, five to 10 years um, in multi-stakeholder fora by academia, um, by civil society and other, other researchers. Um, and it's really important that we tap into that work. And participating in the dialogues, uh, in these multi-stakeholder dialogues, is another route for us to cooperate internationally and help to make our regimes uh, compatible and aligned uh, over time. And finally, and this is a bit of a strange thing coming from a regulator, but we've also seen, especially in the last sort of year or two, uh, a number of law firms and compliance consultancies <laughs> pop up who are, who are focused on advising these platforms on how they make sense of these different regimes. Um, and we should be open to talking to them as well because they are going to be on the, on the coal face of, uh, of compliance. Um, and if we want to ensure that uh, they take a common approach, uh, that companies are taking a common approach, then it's in our interest to speak to them as well. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. So, so it's interesting because f from what he we hear so far, I mean, there is quite a consensus of first that the law has, those all those law are process based and uh, ensure that the platform take responsibility for the system, that this is requiring a transformation for the regulators and a lot of cooperation. And so I think those kind of those are three lines uh, which are important. Um, now, uh, Julian, let's go to you. Um, we have seen that the civil society has an important role also to play in the, in the system. So how do you see um, the um, um, challenge of enforcing the DSA and uh, what you have uh, heard so far from the panel? Thank you so much. Uh, thanks for having me, much appreciated. Um, yes, I, I actually want to pick up on, on exactly those points that that were raised by, uh, by my uh, speakers uh, here on the panel and maybe add a couple of things uh, on, on each point. So the first thing that, that I was really encouraged to hear from uh, Benoit, from Camila, from, from Ita was that um, there are plans for cooperation. There are plans for, uh, for dialogue and information change. I think this um, is absolutely crucial. It's very necessary, so it's, that's great to hear. Uh, I would add to that, or emphasize maybe, because it also came uh, came up, it's not just the regulators, it is also uh, research and civil society, as, as Sally and, and Camilla mentioned. Um, in addition to that, it's also platforms and users themselves, right, that, are, that have a role in DSA enforcement. Platforms can, uh, can voluntarily uh, work on codes of conduct, which I think it's, it's necessary to also include other stakeholders. And uh, platform users themselves um, should also uh, not be forgotten with the complaint mechanism that the DSA foresees, they have really a big role to play in uh, helping regulators identify potential epistemic infringements. Obviously, not every individual complaint will, will show that, but the bulk of them might. So uh, what that means for me is that you would really need uh, in the future some sort of community of practice for DSA enforcement. Regulators, researchers, civil society, as was mentioned, but I would add to that also platforms and, and users. The second point here, when you think of this uh, community of practice, uh, it needs money. Uh, it's, uh, it's a bit of a standard phrase, but uh, uh, it is, again, very encouraging to hear that this is already happening. Regulators are hiring, re re hiring people, they are growing. Um, but we need to ensure, I think, that this happens across the EU and, again, going beyond regulators, not just focusing on, on the authorities, but also looking how can academic institutions, civil society organizations uh, play their role, play their part in DSA enforcement. And that only works if they have enough staff and enough resources to do that. There's a, a bunch of different roles for civil society um, regarding the risk assessment, codes of conduct, advising um, very large online platforms, 
acting as trusted flaggers, you know, that's, those are important tasks, but also cost, costly tasks. So I think it will be very helpful to think about new ways of funding um, as some sort of joint or pooled fund for DSA enforcement where different types of money, different types of money sources come into and also help, re, uh, help consumers uh, play their part in, in DSA enforcement. Uh, that means um, telling them about their rights, telling them about the opportunities the DSA provides to them, but also the limitations. And I would really uh, concur with what has been said earlier, the DSA will not solve uh, hate speech or disinformation online or offline. Those are limits that uh, tech regulation can have. But being open about that, um, about the opportunities and the limitations is really crucial. And the last part here, even if you have this community of practice, even if you have a community of practice with enough uh, resources and staff, I do think it's, it's crucial to keep in mind the core goal uh, of the DSA. And this has already been mentioned multiple times today, so I really just want to emphasize it. I think Rita mentioned it, and Benoit and, and Sally as well. Um, it's about empowerment. Platform users are supposed to be empowered as consumers, as citizens uh, in digital spaces. And I guess what I'm trying to say here is that the, the DSA is not in place uh, for its own sake. It is in place to ensure this goal. And this potentially, maybe, hopefully not, uh, can get lost if there's uh, bureaucratic hurdles, if there's, if there's political bickering. So maybe two things to consider to, to prevent that from happening and to, to look at that goal uh, is one, emphasize uh, risk assessment uh, and particularly the risk mitigation measures. Um, I'm going back to what Sally said at the very beginning. I think it's a crucial piece uh, of, of the DSA because this is what consumers will feel in their everyday lives and see in their everyday lives when they go online, whether um, risks that they might encounter are mitigated um, online. And this is not easy. Um, this has been mentioned, like, there's a lot of balancing that's necessary between different risks, different fundamental rights. You need to define red lines for regulators and platforms. It's, it's, it's a tricky task, but it's an important one because, again, this is, could be a very practical effect that users feel um, when, uh, when thinking about the DSA. And lastly, also on, on thinking about the goal of the DSA, um, I would encourage already looking at the evaluation. And uh, this might be a little bit early because enforcement haven't even, hasn't even started uh, in, in earnest yet. Um, but ev the evaluation will come in a couple of years' time. And uh, I think it's important to look back at these uh, early months, early years of enforcement, see what works, what doesn't work, what rules are maybe good, and which ones are maybe basically transparency for transparency's sake, and they don't actually help people. And then be bold in also changing the rules um, uh, if necessary, if the evaluation uh, shows that in a couple of years' time um, to uh, to make changes to the DSA. So, so this is kind of the outlook that I wanted to provide. And uh, again, thanks for all this uh, this excellent info, which I was uh, really happy to to be able to listen into. Um, it's great ideas. Thanks. Thank you very much, Julian. And, and and thanks also for bringing those those two additional points, which are absolutely key. First, it's the end goal of all of this and the DSA, the DMA is, is user autonomy, user empowerment, and in a way, you know, to regain the early promises of the internet, which to some extent have been lost on the way. So um, I think that that's very, very true. And on evaluation, I couldn't agree more. I mean, a good evaluation is an evaluation that you prepared already know. Not only, I mean, to, for some to know what kind of indicators you will collect and all those kind of things. So this is really something which is important and on which uh, Sarah wants to, uh, wants to contribute. Now, I think Rita is, <laughs> is out for a while, so I will take some question if there is in the room um, on um, what you have heard or also online, if you can ask your question via Zoom. But I don't know if um, some of you um, have... Uh, I have plenty of questions, uh, but um, I first prefer to... Uh, give the priority to um, the user. Um, yes, um, Benoit, um, please, uh, if you wanted to react. Yep. I'm holding it fine. <laughs> Not the antenna. I just wanted to react to what Julian said because really the funding issue is really important. Uh, I guess we have started, of course, all of us doing a, a legal reading of the DSA. 
but you, we should also be having an economic reading of the DSA, because some functions have a mod, an economic model, others don't. Regulators, they have an economic model. They are funded by the government. It's a, requested by the text. Trusted flaggers don't have an economic model. A trusted flagger is a cost. So we will have to build the economic model. We will have to organize the funding of the trusted flaggers and see how can we can get public money, private money, civil society money to fund the trusted flaggers. Article 40 is extremely important, access to data, but research has to be funded. So, and the DSA is not a budgetary law. It cannot be everything. We have budgetary laws at EU level, at member state level, and we will need to act on it and put together the funding. And I could not agree, but you said it already on the evaluation. We know that we are going to face crazy challenges. How do we create trust in this digital world? How do we face information disorders? And the platform will continue what they've been good at, at, at doing, test and try, A-B testing. Uh, they will propose remedies and we'll have to evaluate them and then have the feedback loop. So we definitely, the evaluation and the participation of the academics and the civil society to have this feedback loop. Okay, um, I have one question online um, for, for you also. Um, is, uh, could you please tell us more about the informal grouping between the national DSC or proto-DSC uh, to work on particular element of the, of the text, of the new law? Well, I guess uh, it's uh, official. You have the recommendation of the EU Commission that was uh, issued following the Israel crisis, uh, requesting all member states to start the future DSC to, to start the work in a prefiguration mode. So in most countries, the law is not approved yet, but in many cases, uh, the institution uh, knows that they are about to, in the process of being designated, so you can start working on that basis. And uh, we have done what regulators have always been doing. You have meetings with the commission, you, and then you have working groups. So we, we started this work of just uh, creating a shared vision, because it's really important here. Uh, you have this... <laughs> the issue is with my left hand. Uh, usually, you have the regulators, and below them, the regulatee, the TV stations, the telecommunication operators. Here, when you, and then you have on the parallel, the French regulators, the French regulatees, the German regulators, the German regulatee, etc. Here, with the VLOPs, you have the French regulator, the Greek regulator, the Dutch regulator, and on top of us, we have the VLOPs. We have the same players, they are unique. So we really have to reach a level of having a shared reading of the DSA, a shared vision of how we operate within the DSA, even more importantly than we had in other sector, uh, other regulation. So we basically have uh, reading groups where we have sending our expert as we hire them. Uh, in some cases, uh, I'm really impressed by how the future DSCs have already taken on their responsibility in, with very limited resources for, in many cases, as we, at this point, to get ready and get this shared understanding so that immediately, yeah, we have not reached this uh, symbolic date in February, but we are already implementing the DSA. Okay, and as I understand, there are some subgroup on the DSA working on specific issues. Specifically, I can to prepare. Uh, we, uh, you have to. We took the responsibility of putting together uh, the group on the trusted flagger. So, but ev everybody is participating. We are just the one uh, uh, taking the notes of what is the conclusion of the group. Where do we under have a shared understanding? Where do we have questions to share with the commission? Uh, that's one example. You have another one on Article 40, which is a priority, and we will create them as we move forward, and at the end, all the DSA will be covered. And at the same time, we are doing the same work on a national basis, because of course, and all the DSA, future proto-DSCs are doing the same, the same work, having early contact with the industry and get their question. So in our case, uh, in, in partnership with uh, uh, DGCCRF, our partner for the marketplaces, we had meetings with uh, uh, association of uh, marketplace in France to exchange with them, saying, okay, 
what is your reading of the DSA? Where do you have questions? And this work, which is being done in each country, feeds the discussion at the EU level and vice versa. Thank you. We are about to close, so I don't know if there is one last question in the room. I, I had one online, but that was for Rita, but maybe you know, but I mean, I, 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 I leave it to you also. If the, the public version of the risk assessment will be published, do you, do you know that, Benoit, if uh, some publication uh, are, are foreseen, and also whether any, we will have any guidance from the regulatory authority on this? I guess we are all dying to read the risk assessment. In the process of the DSA, it come, uh, this is the initial year, so you have to kickstart the system. It will come in the future. But I think that platform can take the initiative, and uh, I'm, I think platform should uh, uh, consider just publishing the risk assessment. At this point, no, nothing will happen except that we'll start the discussion with them, and it's positive. Uh, I know it, has, it should, must have been so stressful to issue the first risk assessment, uh, but in one year from now, everybody will have seen the risk assessment of the other, and it will be normal to discuss it. We can let me make this call. In this cooperative, cooperative approach that you're yeah. calling for. So thank you very much uh, uh, for um, the panelists um, uh, here and uh, online. So now we, we have a... a